Section one, identification of the jugular venous pulse. This is the single most important of the three components simply because without it, components two and three cannot even be attempted. You will often hear from trainees and even other colleagues that the jugular venous pulse couldn't be visualized for X or Y reason, usually because of a large neck or the presence of a beard. In our experience, the jugular venous pulse is visible in the vast majority of patients. You just have to know where to look and how to find it. So where do we look for the pulse? The go-to place, the best spot for looking at the, uh, internal, uh, at the jugular venous pulse is the right internal jugular vein. It's ideal because of its direct route down into the right atrium. If you can't find the pulse on the right, then you should go next to the left internal jugular vein. And by the way, when we talk about the internal jugular veins, we're not actually, um, we're not actually visualizing the veins and the vessels themselves. We're visualizing the, the, the movement of the skin that overlies the vessels. That's an important point. If you can't find it on the right IJ, can't find it on the left IJ, then the third option that you should go to is an external jugular vein. And unlike the IJ, the EJ is visible in the neck, much like the veins in the back of your hand. If you've exhausted that list and you still can't find the pulse, don't stop there. There are other places to look, which we'll get into in a moment. Let's talk about the approach to identifying the jugular venous pulse. The, the first step, and perhaps the most important one, is patient positioning. Half the time I walk into a patient's room, they're sort of slouched in bed, they've got four pillows jammed behind their head, their neck is sort of flexed against their chest. And if you try to move the back of the bed to change their angle, it simply just moves their head back and forth. That is not ideal, and you're not gonna set yourself up for success in visualizing the jugular venous pulse. So what I usually do in that situation is I flatten the bed, and I help the patient scoot up so that their head is near the top edge of it. And now when I move the back of the bed, their neck and their torso move as one unit. And that's what you want. You want the neck and the torso to be in the same plane, meaning they're at the same angle. The neck isn't overly flexed, nor is it overly extended. You also want the neck to be nice and relaxed. You don't want the sternocleidomastoid muscles to be flexed in, in your way. And often this is a, a matter of either adding or removing a pillow to make that happen. And in my experience, it's most often a matter of removing a pillow. Next, after you've positioned the patient, you want to observe the neck. And it may seem sort of redundant or, or obvious to include observation as a as a separate step here, but, but we've done this to highlight how important it is because the tendency is to observe the neck from a perpendicular perspective. And if you do that, you're gonna miss subtle and important movement. Imagine you're staring at a wall and you're 10 feet away. Well, you're looking at the wall from a perpendicular perspective. Now imagine you walk up to the wall and you put your right ear against it and now you're looking down the wall. That's a tangential perspective and that's how you wanna uh, observe the neck. Next, you wanna locate movement, any movement. And the, the traditional window for viewing movement in the neck is between the patient's clavicle and the angle of their jaw. If the pulse is below the clavicle, you're not gonna see it. If it's above the jaw, you may see it, uh, but it's not ideal for evaluation. So you wanna manipulate the patient's angle to either bring the, the pulse up from below the clavicle or down from above the jaw and into your viewing window. The final step, you're not done yet. After you've located movement, you're not done. You now have to decide, is that movement venous? or is it in fact arterial? And there are a host of strategies for determining uh, whether you're looking at a venous pulse or an arterial pulse. The waveform itself can be quite revealing. Um, the arterial pulse has a single peak that is quick and sharp. The venous pulse is double and it's undulating in nature, meaning it has a soft rise and fall. The most striking feature of the arterial pulse is the outward movement. Obviously what goes out must come back in, but it does so subtly and gradually and it's hardly noticeable. It's a very passive retraction back to baseline. It's the outward movement that's active and it's the outward movement that will catch your eye and that you will notice. The venous pulse on the other hand, the exact opposite is true. The outward peaks of the venous pulse are passive. They're hardly noticeable. It's the inward movements that are active and will catch your eye, the X and Y troughs. And I put an asterisk there because that's probably, I think, the, the best strategy or, or the one that I use most often. If I, if I see movement in the neck and I see an inward component, I'm done. I know that's venous. The breadth of movement can also be helpful. The arterial pulse tends to be pinpoint involving a small area of the neck, whereas the venous pulse is diffuse involving a larger area of the neck. The arterial pulse is unaffected by patient position, the respiratory cycle, and abdominal pressure. And, and the reason that's true is it's, it's just an anatomical thing. So you know, the reason we see the carotid and feel the carotid where we do, the reason we see the uh, radial and feel it where we do is because that's where the, those vessels course closest to the surface of the skin. And that is completely independent of patient position, respiratory cycle, and so forth.
The venous pulse, on the other hand, will be affected by those things. In terms of patient position, imagine you've got a patient at 45 degrees and you see the venous pulse in the middle of their neck. Well, if you recline them back to a more supine position, that pulse is gonna climb up the neck anatomically. If you do the opposite and sit them up, it's gonna move down the neck. In terms of the respiratory cycle, when we take a breath in, we decrease our intrathoracic pressure and that's gonna cause the column of blood to suck down towards the heart. So the JVP typically moves down the neck with inspiration. Now the opposite can happen uh, where you get a paradoxical rise in JVP with inspiration and that's known as Kussmaul sign. We'll get into that later. But nonetheless, any uh, if there is mo appreciable movement in concert with the respiratory cycle, that argues for, and that su is suggestive of a venous pulse. The venous pulse will move up the neck with abdominal pressure. And finally, the arterial pulse is palpable, whereas the venous pulse is almost always non-palpable with a few exceptions. Okay, now I want everybody to imagine that you're at the patient's bedside. And re recall the steps that we take when evaluating the neck. So we, the step one was position. And we've got the patient at 45 degrees, his neck and his torso are in the same plane. The neck is nice and relaxed. And uh, we are evaluating the neck from a tangential perspective. And actually, let me, give me one second here. I wanna pull up the chat box. And by the way, we're gonna save questions for the end, but um, let's see. But go ahead and fire questions into the chat box and that way I have them for the end. Let's see here. Okay. so. Now we're at the bedside here. We have the patient in position. We're now observing the neck from a tangential perspective. And now the next step is to locate movement in the neck. And I think we can all agree that there is movement in the top third of the neck right in here. Now our last, our final step is to determine is that venous or is it arterial? And if I were to describe this pulse, I would say this is a single outward peak that is quick and sharp. There's not really an, a, an active inward component here. It just goes out. That's what catches my eye. I hardly see it going back in. And it takes up a relatively small, it's involving a relatively small area of the neck. It's almost like you want to put your finger right there. And if you did, you would feel it. This is palpable. And these are all of the features of an arterial pulse. Joe has annotated uh, the video for us. And uh, so we can follow this, this cursor along the tracing and match it up with movement in the neck. And we can see where that pulse occurs. So here, here we go. Boom, boom, boom. I want you to, to think of this movement and then directly compare it to the movement in the following video. So here we have a double peak, a double trough. It's the troughs that catch our eye, down, 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 or in, in. It's undulating, it's got a soft rise and fall. We don't really appreciate the peaks very well. It's really the inward movement that catch our eye. And look how diffuse it is. It's stretching. We can see movement from the bottom of the neck all the way to the top of the neck. Okay. So these are all of the features of a venous pulse. Okay. All right. So we, we mentioned abdominal pressure. So um, this is a physical exam maneuver where you put uh, pressure on the patient's abdomen and you uh, evaluate the effect on the jugular venous pulse. Now it has several applications, but the one I want to focus on is how it can help you identify the jugular venous pulse because we're still discussing the first component identification of the jugular venous pulse so what do i mean by that well if i if i see a movement in the neck and i want to know is that arterial or uh, or venous and i put pressure on the patient's abdomen and that pulse moves up the neck then i'm pretty confident that's a venous pulse and here it is in action so we've got the movement near the, the cursor here and um, with abdominal pressure applied right about now you'll see that movement climb up the neck and now it's near the top near the in the angle of the jaw we mentioned the go-to places for um, evaluating the jugular venous pulse. Our first place was the right internal jugular vein. Sometimes that's unavailable, whether the patient has a catheter on that side or there's a thrombus there. Sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's just not explained and it's just not well seen on the right. Then you should go to the left IJ, as we mentioned. And this video is simply here to demonstrate the left, uh, the uh, jugular venous pulse on the left side of the neck. So you can absolutely see it here and, uh, and appreciate it. If neither of the IJs are available, what was our third option? Our third option was the EJ. And here's a beautiful example of the EJ in the neck. You can actually see it like the veins on the back of your hand. Here it is right here. And um, what I dislike about this video is that it's not filmed from the most attractive vantage point. We talked about the perpendicular not being uh, uh, your best experience. And if we were to we can still see movement, which is great, but if we were to go to the tangential, you would have a much richer experience here. 
But what I do like about this video is it has an arterial pulse just next to an, a, a venous pulse here. So you can really appreciate the differences between them. So just to focus on the arterial pulse at first, um, now this is probably an aneurysmal artery, so it, it, it's not totally normal and it probably takes up a little bit more space in the neck than a, an arterial pulse typically does. But nonetheless, all the other features are, are classic for arterial. It's got a single peak that is quick and sharp. It, it doesn't really have an active inward component. It sort of passively tracks back to baseline. Now compare that to the venous pulse just next to it, where you have an undulating uh, motion, you have a double peak, a double trough. It's the troughs that catch your eye. And look how diffuse it is. It stretches from the clavicle all the way up to the top of the neck. So back to our list. If you can't find it in the right IJ, you can't find it in the left IJ, you can't find an EJ to use, so you can't see it anywhere in the neck, don't stop there. Many clinicians would stop there and they would say the jugular venous pulse couldn't be visualized. And if you do that, you, you're gonna get burned. And you're gonna get burned because sometimes the central venous pressure is so high that even with a patient in the upright position, it fails to drop down below the angle of the jaw. And, uh, and so there are some other places you must look. The periauricular area, the patient's temple, and their forehead are all classic places that the pulse can show up. And here's a great example of the unmistakable collapsing movement of the venous pulse in the periauricular area. If you don't see it in the neck and you don't see it in the periauricular area, look a little bit higher. Sometimes it shows up in the patient's temple. And here it is right here. You can see this collapsing motion in the patient's temple. If you don't see it there, look even higher. Sometimes it shows up in the forehead. In all three of these examples, the clinicians who evaluated the patient said that the jugular venous pulse could not be visualized. And that's because they, they simply failed to look higher. 